Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance in the Crawl Space Studios in Wormtown. Lance, did you see the worm on your way in today? I did not see the worm on my way in today because it is a beautiful day outside. And the worm, as we know, only comes out when it's gray and uh, misty and damp. So uh, I sensed him. I sensed his presence, uh, but I did not see him. And it feels good to be here and, uh, you know, feeling well rested. How are you? I'm feeling great, and this episode today, Lance, is sort of part two of a mini-series, I guess you can say, that we're doing on Greg Overacker, uh, talking about his life as a bounty hunter. And the first episode that we did in this series came out just a few weeks ago, and it was called Hunter. So you want to check that one out if you haven't yet. It's very interesting. Greg tells a fascinating story. Most of the episode is one fascinating story. And uh, actually, this came out September 4th, 2019, so you'll have to go back about six weeks. But um, So th this episode is kind of like part two. Uh, we had him back into the studio, and if you listen to that initial one, that was just me and, and Greg uh, while Lance was off uh, gallivanting on a movie set. Yes, hobnobbing with the stars. <laughs> That's right. And so Greg came back in, and so the beginning of this episode is where all of us, all three of us, are talking and we talk a little bit about the Brianna Maitland disappearance. We talk a little bit about PIs for the missing. Yeah, and what's great about Greg is that he does have all of these stories, but it's a bit of an exercise for you and I to get these stories out of him because he's been living with these stories for years in his days of being a bounty hunter and a uh, you know like a repo guy. He's he's really dredged the the depths of society, and he's come out of it with a great attitude. You would think that after hearing these stories, the ones that he tells us off the air and ones that he's written about, you'd think that he would be this um this this weathered you know bitter cynic, but he's not. He's a really uh, amicable guy. He's he's got a great sense of humor, uh, but he's just not used to telling these stories. So it's a fun challenge to work around his his uh, his walls and try to break those down. So in addition to the stories, you get to hear just a process that I think you and I are trying to develop as we're talking to him. Yeah, he's just such an interesting guy. I love having him in. He's he's just a friend at this point. And you know what? So sexy it hurts. As one YouTube commenter said, so sexy it hurts. And I can't disagree with that. <laughs> and uh, so we do talk about private investigations for the missing, the nonprofit that is l led by Bruce Maitland. Of course, that's Brianna Maitland's dad. And so check out private investigations for the missing. Go to investigationsforthemissing.org. You can actually donate there. And we, we do discuss with Greg a little bit about the goals of the nonprofit. And it's not really fully functioning yet. But one other way that you can help if you can't spare a little bit of money right now is go to Amazon Smile. So go to smile.amazon.com and you can connect your existing Amazon account to donate a small portion of every purchase that you make directly to private investigations for the missing. It is so easy to do, Lance, that uh, I really recommend uh, everybody listening do it. It could really make a difference. Yeah, you know, it's something where you just brought up, you know, if you don't have that extra cash on the side that you uh, that you can donate to a nonprofit like Private Investigations for the Missing, if you do shop on Amazon anyway, you're buying these things that you need anyway. This is a great way to to you know, kill the proverbial bird with two stones. You're, you're doing this anyway. It only takes a second to sign up on Smile, and a portion of that will go to this charitable organization. And these are the, uh, these are the things that this organization needs in order to maintain momentum and get the, uh, get the big donation dollars from those corporate entities that support those big nonprofits. Because this is a huge undertaking that Bruce has decided to embark on, and it really needs that funding in order to make it successful. We all talk about how there's so many unidentified people, so many missing people, so many um, families that have uh, loved ones that they don't know where they are. They don't know what happened to them. And the numbers just keep piling up and piling up. And that's because law enforcement in, in these towns sometimes have like four, six, eight members and the, the current case takes over. So the prior, the prioritization just sort of drops down. This will enable licensed private detectives to go out and get answers for these families like we're all trying to uh, like we're all trying to do. These people are humans and and we just have to make sure that we use this platform in the best way we can. 
Okay, so I hope you enjoyed the episode. Check out our entire archive on Stitcher Premium at stitcherpremium.com. Follow us on Twitter at CrawlspacePod. We're on Instagram at CrawlspacePodcast. And you know what? Please, just give us five stars if you don't mind. Give us the five stars. It just takes a second to move that cursor just a little bit to the right. If you're hovering there around three or four, just pop it on over to five. No harm done. All right, here we are with Greg Overacker, bounty hunter, bondsman, private investigator. What'd you say? Bondsman. Bondsman, yeah. I was never licensed as a bondsman. Okay. I just did the, the pickups. So Lance was wrong. Just so wanna, wait a second. For the wait, record, wait, wait, Lance wait, wait. was wrong. The no, first no. thing he said. You said when you came in here, introduce me as a magician and a bondsman. <laughs> yeah, that's it, yeah. And I, I was like, magician's weird, so I'll go with bondsman <laughs> yeah, first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So Prime what's the difference what's between um, a magician and a bondsman? Yeah. <laughs> oh. What's the difference between a bondsman and what you do? Uh, the bondsman is the insurance agent that writes the bond. Oh, okay. That's too boring for you. Uh, I just didn't didn't even consider that initially. I actually went and got passed the exam, was going to do that in my, in my local area at uh-huh. one point. And I let it expire, and I never did it, and thank God, too, because bail reform's going through January 2020, and they're all gone. Yeah. They're all going to they're all gonna go out of business. All the bondsmen. The bondsmen, yeah. Gotcha. Well, and therefore, all the bounty hunters will, too. So bail reform in 2020. Is it fair to say that, in this case, 2020 does not have hindsight? See what I did there? Ooh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> that is. That was intense, that's, right? That's. Once again, Tim goes meta. Tim goes meta. Um, but I'm going to try to salvage this introduction <laughs> that this I that, great intro. <laughs> that I uh, that I tanked unintentionally. Um, Greg, you uh, came into our world with uh, Brianna Maitland, yeah, uh, and Bruce Maitland. You're the primary investigator on that, along with Lou Barry. Yeah. Uh, and uh, is there any updates that that you want to? Um, or that you're able to give we us? We handed information over to VSP, and they're working on it, and we have to sit and wait, yeah. unfortunately. So we can't really talk about it. And that's Vermont State Police. Yeah. yeah. And that's where we're at. You know, we put together, Lou and I always put together some ideas, and Bruce, well, what we're possibly going to do next, but we have to wait for the outcome of that and hey, just move forward. I'm hoping that the information we get back is good news, but we don't know. Just let us know when you need us to turn up the heat. And we'll just blast out everything. <laughs> we'll send yeah. it right up the ladder. Yeah. It goes all the way to the, to the top here at Crawl Space Media. It, you know, it's a difficult situation with Brianna and, and over the years, all the different things that we've done. And, you know, I, I kind of went in and out of that. And we're not sure. Well, it's, it's a waiting game right at the moment. But, you know, Bruce was saying the other day, one of their social media accounts, they have 75,000 uh subscribers on there and we, here we are trying to get the uh you know the nonprofit up and running and he said if every one of those people gave two dollars we'd be golden and the nonprofit that you're speaking of is private investigations for the missing right and you can find them online at investigations for the org. smile amazon oh Didn't yeah let's that. let's mention that so yes. if you check out uh I did it the other day. How do you do it again? You go to. Do you have to go to smileamazon.com? You have an, if you have an Amazon account, Prime account, or whatever it is, yeah. and you go and you just log in through. You log in just like you always do, but you go in through Smile. Okay, Amazon. so you, if you go to smile.amazon.com, you can connect your Amazon account to donate a half a percentage to every, for every dollar you spend on Amazon goes to PIs for the missing. I was surprised when it, it, all it really does is when you get to checkout, yeah. there's your option, and you start typing it in, and it comes right yeah, up. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Well, the the nonprofit is up and running, and they have been fielding requests for family members who want to look into their uh, loved one's disappearance, and and that, that, that process has been coming together pretty nicely. There's been a lot of organization behind the scenes, people, you know— really stepping up to the plate who 
are doing it for no money. But what you're talking about getting up and up and running is the financial end of it, because ultimately what this organization wants to do is confidently say to a private investigator, we can pay you your expenses, maybe a per diem to look into this person's case. Can't do that right now. You can't do that right now. And the reality of it is that you can hardly do that if you don't have an organization like this. Yeah. So Lou and I are actually going out and doing it at our own expense. And then, you know, hopefully it's going to encourage people to get on board. So those people that are calling in and their families need help, we can't really help them. Um, it's going to be a slow process. We're, we're, we're going to go out, Lou and I talked about it last night, actually, and we're going to start some work at our own expense. Yep. It's going to be slow going. It's not going to be like if we could pay to go there, stay there, do the work, to be thorough, not have to have concerns about going home and going to work and all this other stuff. So it's important. And then Bruce, you know, eventually wants to have people all over the country. Yeah. And this is something he wants to be able to do. He wants to have certain people with certain qualifications. Let's just say it's uh, California or if it's Florida or whatever. He wants to be able to call down there, talk to these people, you know, have them work it, you know, pay them for their services for the family. And uh, it's just it's going to be a lot of money. So we need everybody's help. So you can donate via the website, investigationsforthemissing.org, and go to smile.amazon.com and connect your Amazon account to donate to private investigations for the missing. It's very easy to do. And now a little bit forward in the conversation, we're talking to Greg about his bounty hunter life, and the topic of Brianna Maitland's disappearance comes up again, also the nonprofit. What about a situation that you you didn't find someone at all is there anything like that um that rings a bell and what happens it's funny case? there's there's different guys that uh will tell you that they found every guy they ever looked for if somebody says that you know they're full of shit yeah yeah because at some point you know it's a business proposition at some point if you're looking and you're spending too much money and you get to that point where you're not going to make any money guys will back off you know what i mean yeah so they're not gonna make any money what are they gonna unless they want to save their safe face you know so how are you good at finding people I don't know. I just always good at it. What's the? But that's a skill set that yeah, n- yeah. that's not easy. You gotta for be a lot nosy of as fuck. <laughs> 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 you gotta kind of, you know, be able to read people. And yeah. So I I know that you prefer more of a hands-on, face-to-face encounters. Yeah. Do you do a lot of uh, internet research when you're used looking for to. people, or do you, you just? Yeah, I used to. Yeah. Yeah. It was, but that'll get you so far. It'll get you in a ballpark. You know yep. what I mean? Like you talk to Lou. We'll talk about doing interviews and stuff like that. He wants to sit there with them because he wants to see what they say. He wants to see their, you know, reaction. That was the problem with Brianna's case a lot of times is that, you know, we just didn't have the funds to go out and do a lot of that the way we should have initially. A lot of that kind of went down the tubes. Is it too late? Well, it should have been done a long time ago. If we had done it the way we wanted to, it would have been a different ball game. I think. That's why I wanted the or the nonprofit to be able to just put people to work and keep them there. Well, know. this is an interesting question. You're talking about Brianna Maitland's disappearance, and this is going on now almost 16 years, yeah. correct? So yeah. uh, if you were to be hired for yeah. a disappearance that is over 10 years old, let's say kind of locally, not mm. a lot of travel, but some travel. Right. What? How much time and how much money would you need just as a ballpark? God, you got to think. You know, when I did Brianna's, I'd go up there and I'd stay for a couple of days and come back. Go up for a couple of days, come back. Go to Burlington for a day or two and come back. It's gas, hotels, food, paperwork, going to the courthouse, all this other shit. It's just it fucking adds up so fast. And we would do it as we could. So we would try to like have a have a plan in mind and go do it. Right. And once we achieved that, what we wanted to, we'd come back home. But, I mean, if you start now and, you know, the, the nonprofit gets a case, they really should be able to go and stay until they they feel comfortable leaving. You know, meet with a family, go to the scene, do interviews, get whatever paperwork they can. Certain jobs, you know, the age of them, the police will turn over some paperwork and stuff like that. But talk to the neighbors, talk to every, the people they worked with, where they worked at the time, you know, find out what was going on. Um, when I got involved in Brianna's, we went up there and 
went to the scene and and talked to people. Hank was there. Hank took us around. Oh yeah, 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 which was awesome. Friend of the show. R.I.P. Frank. Uh, Hank Elberelli. <clears throat> yep. And uh, we did some interviews with him and stuff like that. But um, you know, you couldn't stay very long. Yeah. Because we didn't have, we couldn't just, you know, Bruce Bruce couldn't just hemorrhage money like that. Yeah. You know. It's that's too hard on a family, which is the whole purpose behind it, you know. And uh, so we we're just talking about Hank Alberelli, who passed away yeah. recently. He's a journalist who wrote a couple articles about Brianna Maitland's disappearance, yeah, and uh, also someone who passed away in the last year that we haven't. I don't think we've spoke to you much about, but James Robitelli, Brianna yeah. Maitland's oh, ex boyfriend, right. crazy, who died in a car accident yeah. just a few months ago, yeah. um, trying to pass someone on the road and got into a head-on collision and died. Yeah, so little James was the one who spotted the Brianna's vehicle at two thirty in the morning. He initially said four thirty a.m. and then he, you know, he talked to Lou and he said, "Listen, I was, I was, I, I think he had eventually told the police, but he said I was untruthful with the police on a few different occasions." And from what I knew, they got him in there and they really went over him. The police did. I mean, really ragged him. They interrogated him yeah, pretty hard. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, he was out doing drugs that night. He went by and saw our vehicle there. He got out. He touched the vehicle. You know, he shut the doors. He altered the scene. This is a pretty big deal. Both doors are open. Yeah. And she's alone. Uh, you want to know what position the car seat's in and stuff like that. Of course, he got towed and that all got fucked up. And well, what's tragic is that he probably thought he was doing her a favor. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's, Doing drugs all night, so he's obviously not in the right state of mind. But he's obviously yeah. This is if his story to is to be believed, and I don't want to accuse him of anything. But if his story is to be believed, yeah. he, he didn't do anything nefarious. But how do we know that? Yeah. We don't know. But yeah. And you called him Little James. His dad is also James. Everybody, is that... yeah. Everybody referred to him as Little James. Well, yeah. a lot of people did. That's how I knew him. But you don't think he's involved in Brianna's? Or I don't know. Uh, Blue's pretty convinced he wasn't. Yeah. So I don't know. Did you ever speak to other friends of his or uh... Katie and Megan were very close to? They knew James. Yeah. Yeah. Did they ever thought he was? I haven't or... spoke to them in a while. Yeah. I don't really recall. I don't think anybody ever directly pointed a finger at him. Or anything. I think he was just known as a local, and he was into drugs just like everybody else was, and mm. smoking a lot of crack at the time. And he was with another guy who got that night. He was with another guy doing drugs that was mentioned over and over and over and over and over in rumors and that we spoke to. Yeah, so that's interesting to me. Then why, why is that guy mentioned in the rumors and James isn't, isn't. typically found in those rumors? Well, I think it was because of the source. It was where the source came. Yeah. You know, that the, the other guy that was named that was there doing drugs with James that night, Katie had lived, uh, yeah. sh shared a piece of property with him. He had dated Brianna. He had dated... Uh, Keeley, he was one of the players, but yeah, a lot of rumors about him. I'm, I don't have a lot of experience smoking crack. I actually have no experience smoking crack. Oh, okay. You can get some experience. Oh, well, maybe. For <laughs> maybe We're in Wormtown. I'm sure you can find some. Some show prep or something. <laughs> but do you have an opinion on someone who is involved in that type of lifestyle being successful in abducting a young woman oh and, i don't and, know i don't know having no trace of any sort of evidence leading back to them i don't know i just I, we, we talked about this a little earlier i don't know if that i don't know about that but i think generally people have a an idea that it's hard to get away with murder people don't get away with murder if you if you, if you commit a murder you know they're not, somehow you're held accountable it's just not true I'll give you a prime example, mafia figures. Those guys die elderly men. They've killed dozens of people. They never get held accountable for any of it, for any of the crimes that they commit. Um, crime does pay for some people. It's just some people it doesn't. Um, we were looking through cases locally. I was looking through ones in New York State. There's one not far from me. It's in uh, it's near Esperance, New York. Um, and it's back from the 80s where I think anybody, any Buddy that read the the scenario that they put out there for you because she's missing, she's never been seen again, and probably every police officer you ever talked to that investigated said the husband killed her. He just got away with murder. Yeah, you know, pretty pretty plain to see. But that comes up 
more often than you would think. I know. It's crazy. Yeah. There's a popular case that you can look up, uh, Audrey May Heron. Yeah. Which is like, um, it's on the Catskills. And it's really interesting. It hasn't got a ton of exposure. I know I mentioned it to you guys a you few have, times. Yeah. But, and I, and I don't know if this is true, but I know that for a long time that the, the husband was suspected, which I don't know if there's any truth to that at all. But her, her case is just baffling, too. She's just gone. I mean, back to your point about people thinking that there's some sort of accountability that comes with murder. You know, oh, you get caught. You know, there's nowadays you'd never be able to get get away with murder. It's, it happens all the time. There's we have people who cite all of these statistics, unsolved murder cases or missing person cases, and there's tens of thousands of these cases. Yeah, you know, two hundred thousand or or whatever. I mean, th- those are unsolved. Like. People get away with it all the time. And oh, yeah. We, we could absolutely. sit here for the next hour and rattle off stories about bodies that were found. Absolutely. I think it's just a misconception from television and how you think things work and stuff like that. But you can look anywhere you live and there'll be cases that are open. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That are, you know, and a lot of times you'll, you'll notice, especially back in like the 50s and 60s guys kill their wives and oh, nothing, for sure yeah nothing happened to them you know what i mean and the rest of this episode is a continuation of my first conversation with greg from august and uh, the first episode is called hunter and it came out a couple weeks ago so here greg tells more bounty hunter stories and if you haven't heard that first one i highly highly recommend listening to that because he tells an incredible story each each time something I ran into something that was difficult and got involved because a lot of them aren't. They ended up being pretty interesting. Um, you know, I didn't want to. My experience, I think, is a lot different than a lot of bounty hunters' experiences because a lot of these guys that are full time, especially, are in metropolitan areas. You know, if you go out to Los Angeles or something, you'd find a lot of them. New Jersey. I used to go down. You know, spend three four days with Scott. We'd go down and walk Bell Bond Row, and it would be three or four blocks of going in and talking with the guys. It's three or four blocks. Of all the storefronts are bail bond companies. Go in and talk with the guys. He'd, he'd have coffee with them. They'd give us a few files. Go to the next one. They'd give us a few files. Go to the next one. Then go to lunch with some of them. They'd give us a few files. By the time he got done, he had a box full. And then we just start picking them up. And he had, he'd have guys come to his house, and they'd team up. I mean, so it was a different thing that I was used to where you're from somewhere where people don't even know this exists or, or – you know, whatever. It's just not a thing. It's very kind of underground. Yeah. Whereas if you live in, you know, a city or a state where this is a huge thing and you have blocks and blocks of these offices, you're familiar with it. So my work wouldn't be local 99% of the time. The first time I got a call for somebody local, a bondsman in Maryland who was dealing with a, a bondsman in Tennessee. So he was just kind of playing middleman. I knew the guy in Maryland. He said, I got somebody in Little Falls, New York, which is nine miles up the road from my house. It's a little town, little mill town on a canal. Um, so they had run the girlfriend's uh, credit, and that's just a common thing. If the guy's with a girl, always look for the girl first, because if you find the girl, you'll find the guy. So she had tried to buy a car at a car dealership that's no longer there, but it showed up on her credit report. So I went down there, and I was driving through town, and I knew the chief of police, and he was walking down the street, you know, going in and out of businesses and talking to people and stuff, and he jumped in the van I had at the time, and I said, hey, and I told him what was going on. I said, I just want to go past the house and see if the vehicle's there. Sure enough, we go past the house. There's a vehicle with Tennessee plates. He said, let me run the plates. Runs the plates. I can't remember. It came up as something positive, but... That's that's something you don't realize, too, is that it, it, most towns, if you go in there and you have out-of-state plates, they, it's protocol to run your plate if, if you're out-of-state. So um, this town, when you when you come into it, it's it's right on a waterway. Obviously, that's what it, why it was there, because it was a mill town. They used the waterway. But when you're driving in on the street, Flint Ave, uh, there's a cliff there. Um, the stone cliff, so and it's really high. So the, the houses are backed right up to the cliff. Mm-hmm. So I go to this house, and I, I went to the neighbors, and I started talking to them. The neighbor's house next door, 
he had a big dog tied up there. And he said, yeah, he said, something's weird about this guy. He said, uh, when he moved here, I, I helped him carry stuff in the house when he moved in. He said he's got a long gun over his bed upstairs, hanging on the wall. But he said, if he ever tries to come in this direction, because I told him why I was there, he goes, he can't come this way. He said, that dog is mean. He said, I don't even let my kids go near my own dog. So he couldn't go out of the house that way. You know, if you look at the house, there was a cliff behind it, and then there was another house on this side that was an apartment building. So come to find out, uh, in that apartment building was the chief of police's brother, who was also a cop. So the parking for these houses was right across the street. So, again, being kind of young and stupid, I parked right there. I had a old Dodge Caravan, and I parked right there, looking right at the house. And he could have just shot me from the window right in my seat. I mean, unbelievable. But anyway, I had talked to the police and told them I was there and stuff, and they had called the district attorney, and the district attorney while I was sitting there talking to him, literally said to him, don't help him. And they do that for a reason, because if, if, if he's not in NCIC, it's a civil matter. They're not obligated to get involved. Once it goes into NCIC, then they're obligated to get involved. What's NCIC? National crime something computer system that they all use. All the warrants are in there, all missing people, whatever they okay. use. So, but I didn't argue with him. I didn't care to argue with at the time if it came up later i would have if he was in there i don't even remember if he was but um i went back to the house and i parked and i thought you know i'm just gonna t take this asshole out of here i'll just go in and get him i went because i had gone up and i'd looked at the front of the house i ended up knowing a, a guy who knew the landlord told me about it later but it was an old house and it had like a <coughs> a porch that i think was enclosed later on you know do you remember before there was a Lowe's on every corner? There was, you'd buy those tin uh, doors, the the screen doors. They were all tin, and she okay, buy them yeah. like local hardware stores, the old windows and shit. But anyway, I went in. So inside there was the picture window leading into the house. So if you're on the porch and you, you could the picture windows right there, <coughs> I looked in. And he was sitting on the couch. He was probably ten feet from me. And I said, uh, you know, if you don't come out, I'm coming in after you. Either that or I'm going to starve you out. And he got up and bolted up the stairs, and I thought, ah, oh, he's going to get that gun. I just, stupid thing to do. Again, I was young. So I went back, and I sat in the in the uh, van and just watched the house for a while, turned into the entire night. The next morning, the chiefs, who I knew the chief really well. I'd never met his brother. His brother came home from work in his police uniform, handed me the newspaper, he said, you want me to run down and get you some coffee or anything? I said, no, I'm good. I said, all right. He went in his house. It was probably, I don't know, 7, 7.30 in the morning. About 15 minutes later, the kid had gone up into the bathroom, laid down in the bathtub and shot himself. Put a gun in his mouth and shot himself. Fucking cops everywhere. I mean, it, obviously the brother must have heard what happened or whatever. But... So we end up down at the police station, and um, eventually, the you know, talking to the chief about it, and asked me a bunch of questions and stuff, and wanted to see the paperwork and all that crap. And uh, eventually, the coroner came in, and you know, if you're not, if you're not kind of familiar with that, them talking, it's it seems really harsh and abrasive and stuff, you know. But the coroner said, "Look, I cleaned up what I could," and. Uh, I kicked his head under the tub, what was left of it kind of thing. Yeah. The landlord will have to clean it up. Piece of, of his head. Yeah. I mean, you're talking this was, was many hours later by the time this kind of came to be because all the shit they were doing. So eventually I ended up back at the Chiefs. I went to his house one day, um, and we talked to him. He said, well, there's a little more to the story than you know, and blah, blah, blah. Next time you're in town, stop at the police station. So I stopped. We went in where he taught the cadets, and there was a... a opened a file cabinet, took out a stack of uh, pictures and put them in front of me. And I'm looking at them, and it's pictures of him killed. It's the the, ki the guy in the tub with his head yeah. blown off. And I said, I don't fucking see this. You know, <laughs> What's the matter with you? And he goes, well, I thought you'd want to see him. No, I don't. He said, well, keep looking. So I'm looking through, and there was a girl in, a, in lingerie, and 
uh, he said they think he killed this girl. She He had jumped bail for something else. But they think he killed this girl. Uh, so they came up and they took uh, hair samples off of him, checked the DNA and this and that, and all this other stuff. State police took his computers out of there. Apparently, he was uh, he was printing summonses and warrants on his computer. And the neighbor had, had said this to me, too. He said he leaves really late at night, and he comes home real early in the morning, and he dresses really nice. And he carries a briefcase, and I'm like, what? He's working third, what the hell is he doing working third shift dress, dressing like that, you know? So they thought that he was printing up warrants for criminal purposes, for whatever reason, who knows, abduction, or I don't yeah. know. But I said, geez, we never heard of anything like that around here. He goes, well, if he's doing it, he's probably driving huh. away from here to do it. And I never heard anything after that about that, <clears throat> and neither did the chief that he told me anyway. You know, he said that the kid's father came to pick up the body, and he was like the top tier of the U.S. Navy. He was mm. a big, big wig. And um, he said, my son could re could uh, memorize computer text, could literally read and memorize it. But he, he was always a criminal. So I mean, he's a young guy. He's probably 30, 32. But I always remember that. It just seemed so, so strange that one simple thing blossomed into all that other stuff, and they thought he had killed somebody and all that stuff. It was, it was strange that uh, we would... We had guys tell us about crimes they committed that they weren't charged with. We'd have them in their custody, in our custody, and they would tell us about crimes they committed. And we'd be like, you know, they might not want to tell us. It. We would tell guys when we picked them up, if you got drugs on you, because they don't want to tell you, I'd say, tell me now. I'll chuck them. But if you get to the jail and I don't find them on you, you're going to embarrass me, and they're going to charge you. Mm-hmm. So we would just take the drugs and, you know, throw them. Yeah. But it happened on more than one occasion. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> so there was uh, there was one other story I wanted to ask you about, um, and I don't know all the details, but I remember there was um, there was a part. It was a samurai sword, and it involved a, <laughs> a chase in, a, in an yeah. apartment. Yeah, that's a long story. Um, but he was rooting around underneath a mattress, and I didn't know what it was. We ended up getting a fight in the apartment. And um, the what stood out was the, the you remember the old glass windows that were before I don't know how to explain it when you when you busted them they would fall in shards. Okay, you know what yeah, I'm talking about? Sure. You still see them in old apartments, really shitty windows, and they'll they'll just it, you you worry if you slam them shut, the whole thing's mm-hmm. going to cut your wrist <laughs> and stuff. You know, yeah. he had backed me up into a window and the window shattered. I had a leather jacket on, but I thought, oh man, it's going to cut my back of my neck or something. You know, it didn't, but. But he ran, and when and he lost me, and I was like, "What's he rooting around under the mattress for?" And I flipped it up, and it was a sword. Yeah, like you'd see in a pawn shop. Yeah. So he was, you know, most people that buy a sword like that in a pawn shop, or you see him hanging in their house, kind of like a lot of people with guns. It's an inflated sense of self-esteem, you yeah. know. But he was going to use it. <laughs> he was trying to get it as as quick as he could, and I didn't let him. But um, yeah, it freaked me out. And I think I remember now that uh that he had pushed you against the window and then taken off down the hall yeah and so there was a couple of doors bedrooms i think that he could have been in when you chased well him. when he left in the way in he it's a it's a really long i'll tell this story sometime okay. i don't know it's exhausting that's okay yeah, well, but when he left it was four floors up and if you ever been in those buildings the old buildings where the the big stairways that go down you can actually look down through to the yeah. to the vestibule or whatever sure he had gotten all the way down to the end and collapsed down at the end. He was just laying there, and I thought he was gone. I went. I actually went in the bathroom of the apartment and washed up. I had really long hair at the time. I was picking glass out of my hair and washing up. I had blood on me and stuff And because he was caught pretty bad, really bad. From the glass? Yeah, and uh, I stuck a lamp in his face, too. There was a lamp with no, no uh, shade on it, yeah. I just... Psh, hit him in the face with it but but he was down there and I went and got him I had a black eye my eye swelled up to the point where I, I couldn't see out of it and it was I knew it was coming have you ever been hit in the face really bad before sure 
he, I, he hit me in the face more than once really bad. Once was so bad that you could, I could, like, smell ammonia. You ever have that happen? I don't know about that. Uh, yeah. uh, it, see a flash of light, and I could, just, like, smell ammonia. And then I could feel my face tightening up. And it's pulling all the skin on your face is tightening up. And, but I washed up, and I'm standing in the bathroom, and my shirt was kind of torn. I had a leather jacket on it. It looked like something out of a movie, like somebody had thrown paint on me. And I'm like, fuck. And I thought, I'm, I'm, he might have cut my back of my neck. He didn't. Um, I was cut up a little bit, but not not like he was. But when I went down and got him, he was a he just looked like a bag of smashed assholes. He was just done, <laughs> you know. And I I pick him up and I'm we're, we're leaving, and we had to go out of the building and cross the street to my van. We were walking across the street, and this little old lady was walking across the street towards us. And she goes, oh, is he okay? She's just an old lady. She didn't know what the hell was going on. I go, ah, he's got the flu. <laughs> he's, got the flu. Yeah. he's got the flu. He's all blood and shit, you know. But uh, wasn't there a moment where when you had gone down the hallway that uh, you weren't sure which room he yeah. was in? And if you and you happened to guess the room that he was when in. I, when I first went in, the apartment was... You know, it's funny. I, I still go in those apartment buildings like that now, like locally where I live. Um, the, the real shitty when you go in a shitty neighborhood. But there's that real musty smell. Like the, they'll have those big, huge doors. You ever see those doors that are like nine, ten feet high? Yeah. There's two of them. They open up, and uh, now you'll find them. It just seems like such a shame. People paint over them, but they, they have the old plate glass in them and stuff. And you could just tell it's not good at keeping out the elements. But they would have been beautiful back in the day. You know? Yeah. And uh, then the the stairways was like really wide. They didn't worry about that shit back then. Now they now they try to conserve every square foot of space, you know, and when they're building something. Back then the stairways were really wide, and you'd go up and you hit a landing, and then you go up another one, you hit a landing, and it just kept going up around, you know. But the, it was such a shitty building. There was like you know holes in the wall, and the carpets haven't been cleaned in you know twenty years, and. But the door in the apartment was like what you would use as like a bathroom door. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. just, you could push on them, push them open. They're the hollow, shitty doors. Yeah. So I just, I knew kind of what to look for. When you go in those buildings, there's there's usually like a little kitchenette. And then and it's like an archway and there's a kitchenette. And then there's an archway and like a living room. And then like that living room and, and that hallway will go into a little living room. And then there was a. Which I didn't know where it would be, but there's a, a little hallway with bedrooms. So when I went in, I I, I just figured I, I'm going to go through this door in an instant. So I just barged through it. Literally, just you could hear it just break. And uh, I had to look either one way or the other, and I looked to the right, and I, it was the wrong way, and he fucking hit me over the back of the head. I went down. I hurt so bad when I went down. He hit me so hard. It almost didn't hurt. You ever have mm. somebody bonk over the head like that? Yeah. I, maybe I've been hitting the head too many times. <laughs> <laughs> I feel, but, yeah, I just hit the ground in a heap. And when he got up and ran, when I ended up finally chasing him out of that room, getting up, he went into the hallway, and I didn't know what room he went into until I heard the door slam. Uh -huh. And I just went right through the door, too. A second I almost door. went off my feet. I went through the door. So. Wow. And that's only, you know, I haven't had a whole lot of that shit happen. I mean, that's you're talking years in between. You know, and thank God it was kind of when I was younger too, but yeah. It, but if you had chosen a different door, or if you didn't, yeah, if you know, I had gone in and looked to the left, he probably would have hit me in the face. I don't know, but right. he just happened to be in that kitchenette part of it. Yeah, you know, um, maybe if I had waited, or I literally could see under the door. I should have probably just watched under the door for a while. That's you know, <laughs> that's one of the first things I usually do is look under the door, see if I can see their feet. But that was a shit mess too, um, and he was a, a fucking really bad dude. He he uh, he ended up getting killed in prison, um, and I never found out exactly. It was something to do with a white Aryan nation or something. Oh they, boy, they fucking yeah. killed him in some kind of gang thing. Jeez. All these guys that were in New Jersey, they would they had friends who were COs and the guys that were bounty hunters and PIs and stuff and. 
the few new guys that went in there that got locked up and stuff, they all knew who they were. And some of the guys, other bounty hunters would pick them up. They, oh, you picked him up. I picked him up and this and that. You know, so everybody knew everybody kind of. And I don't think I could chase somebody down like I could. It's a pretty then. risky lifestyle, yeah. I'd say. Yeah, high well, that, risk. That's what ended up happening was I got married. Yeah. And when she moved in with me, we weren't together for a real long time. But when she moved in with me, she said, I don't want nothing to do with this. You know, you need to stop doing this and stuff. So I kind of phased it out. And then when she left, uh, when we divorced, I went back into it. But it, it never was as as busy as I was. You know, all my clients kind of thought I was done. Yeah. But um, and I still did it. But um, she would get freaked out because we'd come home. And, of course, back then you had the old answer machine. You'd come home, there'd be a bunch of beeping on there. And it would be Scott, the guy I worked for. And uh, hit the thing, beep, and you'd go... I want you to be careful tomorrow. This guy's a shooter. Or you'd say he's a shooter and a runner. <laughs> She'd be like, what? What the hell is going on? Your friends and family kind of like got a peek of the life, but they never really wanted to look fully. She she knew what was going on, and I went away when I was seeing her. I went to Las Vegas the first time when I was seeing her with Scott to a, a PBUS convention. And, um, you know, she just you're young too and you're in love and you're going to be married and all this shit and she didn't want they don't want you going away and doing all this weird shit and you know it's not like I was you know selling cars and going to a convention or something I was it was a weird convention well PBUS is professional bail agents in the United States so it's a bunch of bail bondsmen but their mother companies go the uh you know the companies that they write for and they'll take all their guys. Uh, I think Scott was with Lexington at the time. They'll take all their guys out to dinner and to shows. They took us to see David Copperfield and a bunch of other shit. And, but he paid for a bunch of classes to go to, and uh, that was pretty cool. You'd go through, and, and it's the convention centers are just beautiful. You know, you'd go into your class, and there'd be 50 people in the class, and they'd have a buffet and, you know, coffee and tea and whatever you wanted. And... You know, they'd hand you out a bunch of stuff and go around and talk with you, the interactive kind of stuff and stuff like that. It was it was really nice. And, uh, you know, when you're from, uh, from the East Coast and you go out to something like that, everything's clean. Yeah. You know what I mean? Bigger, newer. Everything's carpeted in there. Yeah. You can do that in New York State. Everything be shit mess, dirty, filthy, you know? It's just newer everything. Yeah. It's beautiful. Every time you walk outside, it's beautiful and stuff. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was it was a cool experience. I ended up going back a bunch of times, but that the first one was kind of neat because I was with Scott and stuff. And I ended up at a table with like, I don't know, maybe a dozen guys. And they were guys from all over the place. There was a guy from Israel. There was a guy from Mexico. There was a guy from Canada. I don't even remember where else. They were all bound. These, these were serious dudes. This is These are countries where bounty hunting is Ill- illegal. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the, the, what we do, you know, because other than they're going to get people back for these people to the country. These are the guys that shoot, kidnap, and steal for a living. That's what they do. And you're getting drunk and stuff, and the guy started showing scars. And I was probably, I don't even know, I was probably 27 years old. So I think, what the fuck am I doing here? What the fuck am I doing here? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I need to go home and get a job. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but uh, it was a cool experience. <laughs> I, I was probably a little older. I was probably 29 at the time. But you were like, this is this is my life if I keep doing this. I was yeah, thinking, what the fuck did I get myself into? Yeah. You know, it was just so weird. Yeah. I don't know. These people are older guys, and they're just all the fucking crazy dudes and stuff. But most of it, you know, those conventions, he just went to one, actually. For the most part, they're extremely professional. Yeah. And the, the, the bondsman portion of it, they're extremely professional. These guys are insurance agents you know what i mean this is kind of falls that kind of falls away when you get in the bounty hunter section of it but yeah